Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Utterly Understandable. Um, hope everyone had a good uh, Christmas and New Year's. Um, Robbie and I were just chatting about ours earlier. Um, so, hey, today what we're going to be talking about is the um, supply and demand balance um, in, in dairy, um, given that it's a particularly volatile um, sort of area. Um, so, Robbie, over to you. Cheers. Thanks, Hamish, and Happy New Year. So today we're going to have a look at supply and demand in dairy. And one of the things that we can kind of say about dairy and we can say about demand is it's relatively steady in its growth. It's really relatively constant. It goes up by one or two percent each year, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. But for the most part, it follows an upward trend. And the trend is correlated to things like the strength of the US dollar versus the oil price, the rising middle classes in Latin America, Southeast Asia, um, India, for example, all of these, you know, increases in wealth slowly filter through into increased dairy consumption. So because of this demand is generally growing at a relatively you know, stable rate. There's no big jumps of 10% or falls of 5%. Um, you know, that, that's a very rare occurrence. It generally meanders along. However, because when we think about dairy, when we think about dairy capacity and production capacity, on the supply side, supply doesn't match demand in the same way. And what I mean by that is supply tends to come on in big chunks. We're stable, we're in a stable environment, demand starts to grow above supply, and as a result, it reaches some point where the returns become such that they drive investment. And if we have a look here, what we can sort of see is our dark blue line is supply, our lighter uh, aqua line, uh, sorry, is supply, our dark blue line is demand. When demand is above supply, we have the shortage, and when the shortage grows enough, when the shortage becomes big enough and the prices increase, that will then prompt people to invest. But we never, because dairy capacity is so expensive, we never just invest to meet today's demand, we invest to meet tomorrow's demand. So this drives overinvestment, if you will. It drives us to invest in additional capacity beyond what is needed because the incremental cost of that capacity is so much lower than if we were to bring it on at a point in the future to do with, you know, the fixed costs of stainless steel. Uh, you know, two ton an hour dryer does not cost half as much as a five ton an hour dryer. It, you know, a five ton an hour dryer barely costs 50% more, but you're getting more than double what's out of it. So, that's kind of the rationale as to why supply comes on in big chunks. And as a result of that, we then get these areas here where now supply is greater than demand. And as a result, we have surplus and we have relatively low pricing. And this, is, this constantly is going on when we think about how many people consume dairy in the world, when we think about how many different dairy firms there are constantly investing, you know, everybody is making decisions independent of them, of others trying to guess what the others are doing. And as a result, it drives this very jumpy supply results uh, where we find supply coming in, in big tranches. You know, there'll be a massive shortage of quick, um, uh, quick frozen mozzarella. And then all of a sudden, there'll be five companies that bring on new plants all within one year, having no, you know, nobody invested for the previous three years. And this is why we have this disjointed relationship between dairy supply and dairy demand. Yeah. Thanks, Robbie. Um, yeah, I mean, that. Uh, what, what I was thinking about there was um, lactoferrin um, and just how you can see swings in, in, in that product from, from well over a million dollars to... To down into the hundreds of thousands as um, as additional capacity comes on, um, 
and and is oversupplied, and then people seek to uh, to maximise a return out of that. So, so thanks for exactly. Taking us through uh, Robert. Yeah, I always think of uh, WPC eighty. How when I first started in the industry, WPC eighty was well over twenty thousand US dollars a ton, and then everybody started investing in it, learning the technology, learning how to make it. And today, WPC-80 sometimes is worth less on a protein basis than just pure sweet whey powder because it's become over-commoditized. So those products like Lactoferrin, those products like WPI, um, at some point they will become commoditized. WPI certainly more quicker than Lactoferrin, but one would think that you know at some point in time, while Lactoferrin won't become like skim milk powder or whole milk powder, it will certainly not have the same returns that it once did. Mm, yeah. All right. Well, well, that's it for another um, episode of um, Utterly Understandable. Um, uh, tune in next week for our, our next update.